welcome to uh, everyone. Uh, we are going to hopefully explore some of the fascinating and profound uh, creative thought of uh, Orha Chaim on the uh, uh, Parsha of Nasso. Uh, Parsha's Nasso uh, deals with interesting subjects. Uh, two prominent features, quite well known, although somewhat um, uh, shall we say foreign to our experience, but nevertheless prominent events, prominent mitzvot mentioned in the Torah. In fact, each one has a whole tractate devoted to it. One is Sota and the second is Nazir. There are other subjects as well, but those are the two that I'd like to hopefully be able to touch on tonight. So we're going to start with uh, chapter five in, in uh, Bamidbar, in Numbers chapter five, and that begins just find the place myself with the law of the sota the sota is the woman who is actually it starts with with verse 11 uh, this is the law of the woman who is suspected of adultery the suspected adulteress is the sota and the reason i emphasize suspected adulteress is that as we shall see in a moment uh, or Chaim says that the phenomenon of the Sota can have at least two, later on we'll see a third possibility, but at least two manifestations. So let's start with chapter 5, verse 11. Now the first pasuk is very conventional. Uh, we find it in the Torah hundreds of places. This is the formula by which Hashem normally um, like begins a parsha or a chapter or a paragraph in which he instructs Moshe to tell the, the people whatever it may be. But now let's look closely at the next possible good base. Daber ben Yisrael amarta alehem. Now, Or HaChaim makes an observation here, which he does in many places, and that is the repetition or the kefel lashon, the double expression. Daber el ben Yisrael amarta alehem. It's not necessary to say both. They could just say... Dabrel ben Israel uh, as follows Ishish Vamarta Alehem is a bit um uh I wouldn't say exactly redundant, but there is a nuance there that warrants explanation and exploration. And then immediately after we have a further redundancy. Ish ish kitiste ishta. Now According to the biblical idiom, the repetition of a word like ish ish is just used for stylistic purposes or maybe for emphasis, but it does suggest whoever it may be, any man who suspects his wife, kisiste ishto, or whose wife uh, strays, the word sote really means to stray, kisiste uh, ishto umaalo vo maal, and she is acts treacherously towards him. That is to say, she betrays him through infidelity. And another man sleeps with her, consorts with her intimately. And this is hidden from her husband's eyes. Venistara, and she is uh, um, in seclusion. She is uh, in a clandestine rendezvous. Vehinitma, and she has become defiled through this event. The aid ain't Baba, there is no witness to the event. Vihilonispasa, she hasn't been caught, she hasn't been apprehended in the act neither by a member of the public or an acquaintance or her husband himself, but there is a suspicion. So we'll look into that more closely in a moment, but for, for now, I want to share with you what Or Chaim says about those redundancies. Daber va'amarta, which on the one hand is a repetition of the same idea, but at the same time, Dibur and Amira have a subtle difference between them. We mentioned this in the past because he, Or Chaim, mentions it. I've seen it many times already. Daber means to speak in a harsh, maybe... Um, uh, declarative way. Uh, we would use the word in English, it's, it's, it's reminiscent of it, not exactly the same idea, but the word to dictate, as in a dictator. Uh, so to say something in a kind of forceful manner, that's dibur. Amira is always, we find Amira Raka. It's a more uh, tender, a more sensitive, a more gentle expression. The English to speak or to say doesn't quite connote the same nuance of difference. Orachaim also mentions something which is found in the Talmud, and that is the word amira also means to exalt or to uplift. 
we have uh, later on, we have in Devarim, it says, Es Hashem He'emarta Hayom. The word He'emarta uh, um, means to exalt or to elevate. And uh, Ramban also mentioned this actually. And Ramban says something quite interesting. He says that it's similar to the Arabic word Emir, E-M-I-R. I mentioned in the past, there's a place called United Arab Emirates. They even have a football stadium named after them. Uh, so this is the word Emir, and Emir is like a sheikh um, uh, or, or a sultan, something like that. So the Hebrew word um, Amira or Va'amarta uh, has that connotation of like elevation, a person of prominence. It's an expression of esteem. So, so, and then again, the ish, ish, the repetition of ish, says, or hachaim, there are two types of sota that the Torah is referring to. Because even though the classic scenario is where the woman is guilty of infidelity and she pays a price for, for, for that, even though there were no witnesses, but the uh, trial, the, the water, the bitter waters actually, uh, in a way, evaluate and bring about the punishment as well. But of course, there can be another scenario of the woman who is innocent, the woman who is suspected and, and wrongfully so. Now, she has done something to raise her husband's suspicion. And the Talmud describes the circumstances under which a man is even allowed to um, insist that his wife comes with him to the base of Migdash. And by the way, if she refuses or if she confesses, then she doesn't come to any harm, uh, or at least she doesn't come to, 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 to death. But it's only where there are legitimate grounds for his suspicion. If he has no grounds, but he's just um, maybe paranoid or the relationship is troubled in other ways, then the system will not work and she doesn't have to go to the base of English in the first place. So there are grounds for suspicion, but nevertheless, a woman who is guilty and a woman who is, who is innocent, these are two different scenarios. So that's what Archaim says, that the Torah here is speaking about a, a woman who is guilty, but also about the possibility of the woman who is innocent. And as we shall see later on, when the woman is innocent, then actually the waters cause her no harm. On the contrary, they bring her blessing. Besides which, and he makes this point as well, ultimately this ordeal, although no doubt it's humiliating for a woman whose behavior has invited that kind of suspicion, but ultimately, for a woman who is innocent, it removes the shadow of suspicion and of jealousy and of resentment. And if their relationship is strained because he cannot uh, like, uh, uh, put out of his mind the suspicion that her, his wife is consorting with another man, then the marriage, of course, is going to be strained and, and may be doomed even. But if this ordeal proves her innocence and proves that she is, is uh, not guilty of infidelity, then it will have the effect of removing that shadow from their marriage, and it can actually be a means of, of uh, bringing bringing about restoring a, a, an atmosphere of love and harmony within, within the marriage. So this is what uh, Orachayim says, why the Torah, although initially speaking of the woman who is guilty, but the Torah goes on to also explore or describe the possibility that she is innocent, in which case she's actually blessed by these waters. And therefore it says, Dibur uh, va'amarta, because there's a positive side to this as well. There's the side to this ordeal, which actually is a guarantee, or at least can, can be a, a, a means of, again, restoring faith and love within this marital uh, union. So that's why it says ish ish, because again, there are two different scenarios. I hope we'll have a chance towards the end to see maybe a third uh, possibility uh, as well. Excuse me one moment. Okay, Orachayim takes us much deeper into the subject as well. So he says with regard to verse 15, take a look at Pasuk Tezvav. It says here, after the, uh, the introduction, where we have the description of the woman who may be guilty of infidelity, she has raised her husband's sus suspicion, 
or maybe she's innocent, but at any rate, the husband is jealous of her. So it says in uh, verse 15, the man will bring his wife to the Kohen and uh, uh, she will bring or uh, or he will he will bring her offering which is a tenth of an ephah. it's a certain measure of kemach of flour but this is not wheat flour which is generally regarded as superior to other grains that's why most of our um, bread and other grain products is made from wheat because that's the best it has properties which make it more more desirable but there's an alternative and this is the alternative saorim saorim is barley now barley is perfectly edible but it's not as good not as nutritious and doesn't have uh, the popularity of wheat and in fact barley is associated with animal fodder and this requires an explanation. Why is it that this offering is of barley rather than wheat? Most of the offerings in the Beis Amigdash are of wheat. The great majority of uh, flour, of grain offerings are all of wheat. It's unusual we have of saorim. Of course, the Omer is an example of that for a particular reason. So it requires an explanation here as well. So Rashi has an approach. Rashi says, um, well, this is animal fodder because we're talking here about the suspicion of behavior which is animalistic, behavior which in, in which a, a the woman and no doubt her uh, co-adulterer, they have succumbed to the baser instinct, the baser motive motivation, the animalistic aspect of human, uh, the human experience, and therefore she brings an offering of Saorim. As we shall see, Orachaim uh, goes much more uh, deeply into it. So we have also the expression here, Mazkeres Avon, if you take a look at uh, verse um, yeah, 15, towards the end of that pasuk, uh, it says, Kiminchas Zikaron Maz. Peret Avon. This is a remembrance offering to recall, to bring to mind Avon transgression. So Arachim says, what do we need the, the zikaron, the, the recollection to remind her um, was uh, this event, did it take place so long ago that she's forgotten about it? Or maybe it was a highly forgettable uh, incident. It's, it requires an explanation why we have Mazkeret Avon. Uh, presumably, this event, if it happened at all, is something that doesn't require prompting. This, the, the, the recollection of it is not difficult to, to bring to mind. And yet the Torah says clearly, Zikaron, something to remember, Mazkeret Avon. And we asked already about the Saorim. Uh, the Torah goes on to say that the Kohen, in verse 17, Velakacha Kohen Maim Kedoshim, Holy water, the holy water is from the laver, from the from the kior, and it's been the water has been sanctified by being placed in this in this uh, kior, and it's maim chaim. It's been drawn from an underground wellspring. Why does the Torah call it maim kedoshim, holy waters? We mean ha'afar, and the afar, the soil, has to be specifically. Keep reading. Asher ye bakarka hamishkan. It's from the the earth immediately within the mishkan. In fact, in the base of Mikdash, they had a tile that was. Was removable and uh, the the soil there was prepared for this purpose i don't know how common the soto ordeal was presumably not that frequent but it was something that was prepared and they were ready for it and the or earth the soil came from exactly that place in the mishkan and the torah says explicitly but karka hamishkan vanasan el hamayim he shall place it upon the water now the talmud records an opinion that this order is deliberate. That is to say, the water goes into the container and the earth, the, the, the dirt, the soil has to be sprinkled upon it as opposed to the other way around. You might think you put the, oil, the soil in first and then you pour the water onto it, maybe you stir it around. And yeah, the Torah says uh, here that the water has to, venasan el hamayim, the, the afar is placed upon the water. And there is an opinion in the Talmud that it has to be that way. If it's done the other way, it's um, invalid. So this requires an explanation. That kind of um, detail, uh, why it has to be in that order rather than a different order. And then he says, Bechlal, the whole enterprise uh, requires an explanation. And he observes something interesting. The Torah uses the word chok or chuka in many places, uh, most famously, we have a parsha called Chukasatora, Zos Chukasatora, which refers to the famous Para Aduma, the red cow or the red heifer. 
And uh, we find the word chok actually in, in many places is not unusual. And we know that the word chok is especially associated with a mitzvah, which is inscrutable. A mitzvah, the explanation for which is not at all obvious. In fact, uh, the classic instance of a chok is a mitzvah which seems to almost uh, defy any kind of logic or any kind of symbolism. Says Or HaChaim, it's interesting, the Torah doesn't word, use the word chok here. It doesn't say this is a chok or chukas or anything similar. We find the word chok many places. And the word chok implies that you may not be able to understand it. And this is a product of the divine wisdom. It may transcend human logic. The Torah doesn't say that here. He says clearly, Or HaChaim says that if it had said chok, then it would have had the effect, listom pi shoel, lemor lo tishal, as a way of saying, don't ask. You're, you're not going to understand it. But it doesn't say that, says Or HaChaim. So all of these details, which are, are perplexing, must have an explanation. And unsurprisingly, uh, the rabbi is going to tell us his approach. He says that uh, we find, and he's quoting a, a medrash, which uh, the Hasidim make a lot of this. We find it in the, as I say, Hasidic literature, the mystical literature, although it actually comes from a medrash, not, not from the esoteric part of our tradition, uh, that uh, Hashem desired a dira batachtonim. He wanted to have a residence. That's probably not the right word. He wanted to be able to dwell in the lower realms. Hashem wanted to, like, uh, his, his presence to be compatible, to be manifest with the experiences of, the, of, of humanity. It's a way of saying that Hashem's desire is for the world to be a place which is compatible with holiness and even with God's holiness uh, himself. So he says that the, the um, undoing of this desire, so to speak, was, of course, the hate Adam Harishon, that when Adam and Eve were created in the Garden of Eden, so that was an experience, that was a circumstance that was idyllic, and much has been written about it to understand what life was like at that time, and uh, Orachim has written about that earlier in his commentary extensively, I mean, in the in Parshas Bereshis, but one thing is clear, that it went downhill after the chet, after Adam and Eve, or really Chava, and then Adam ate from the, the Eitz Hadas. As a result of that, the Torah says clearly that the earth was cursed because of it, because of, of Adam's sin. The earth will not yield its produce, but rather it will uh, produce uh, thorns and thistles and all of that. So the earth was cursed. And the water as well. And he has a kind of extended discussion of the water, how the, uh, the water cries, the water is associated with tears because there's the upper waters and the lower waters, that is to say the waters in the heaven and the clouds maybe, but there's also the lower waters, the, the waters of the sea, which are salty. And he said, this is a symbol of the, like the, the water itself uh, regrets. The water itself grieves for the corruption of nature, which has driven God, so to speak, into the heavens. And as a result, the, the water and the earth are included in the word, in the term arur. Arur means um, cursed. And by the way, this water is called the Maim Hama Ararim, the water that brings curse, the curse bearing water. He says like this, and here's the, his approach. The reason the water has to go into the vessel first and then the soil on top of it, and then they're mixed together. And then, of course, he writes the name, the uh, verses from the Torah, including the name of God on a piece of parchment, which is placed in the water and it's dissolved. He says, because it mirrors the process of creation. When the world was created, so Hashem first created the water. And then subsequently he said, Yikavu hamayim el echad, may the waters gather together uh, like kolek in certain places, v'teira'eh hayabasha, and they, let the dry land be apparent, be visible. In other words, at first the earth was covered in water, and then Hashem willed that the water should be collected in certain places, in the oceans and in the seas, and the dry land would therefore be visible. So since the water preceded the earth, 
preceded the soil in the process of creation, or at least in the sort of uh, appearance of the of the dry land. Similarly here too, because this is the recreation, or I should say the recreation rather, the recreation of of the the world like a kind of return to the a process of creation as we'll see in just one moment because he says this minchas saorim why was her her offering of barley rather than of wheat he says not like rashi i mean not different but a different approach to what rashi suggests he says it brings to mind the offering of cain remember cain and abel so Hevel brought an offering of the flock, the best of the flock. Cain brought an offering from the ground. And according to our tradition, what he brought was evidently of a low quality. It was sort of what he didn't want for himself, so he gave it to God. And that is evident from the fact that the Torah describes how Hashem accepted the offering of Hevel and rejected the offering of Cain. And he, or Chaim says that the Saorim, which is the inferior type of meal offering brings to mind that's the mascaris avon the sin that it brings to mind is the avon of Cain and the avon of adam and chava as well which which brought about the downfall of man and that caused the waters to cry and that caused the earth to be cursed he says furthermore that this uh, instance of of infidelity and suspected uh, um uh, transgression of, of a sexual nature, he says, also evokes the memory of the original transgression. It's not original sin in the Christian sense, but uh, of that instance of chet eitz hadas. I don't want to get too Freudian here, but we have a tradition that the serpent, the the uh, nachash, that um, accosted Chava and that uh, like in uh, seduced her or enticed her to eat from the tree of knowledge that uh, there was a sexual component to this encounter as well. The rabbis say, Hitil ba zuhama, that the, the serpent, which represents the Yetzahara, implanted within Chava, implanted within her this desire for, um, for uh, transgression and sort of internalized the Yetzahara. And of course, Adam ate from that fruit as well, and it put the two of them in a similar circumstance. So says the Or HaChaim, this example of adultery, if indeed she is guilty, we'll soon see in a moment the other possibility, but if she is guilty, and she certainly is suspected of guilt, so it's like a kind of uh, return to the transgression, return to the hate that brought about the downfall of man in the first place. Why is the water and the soil from the Makom Hamikdash? Because that became the place where Hashem dwelled on earth. The, the Mishkan, the tabernacle, or later on the Beis Hamikdash, symbolizes the place where Hashem could dwell on earth because it was a place of holiness. It was a place of, of peace. It was a place where the awareness of Hashem was manifest and people went there to get close to Hashem and to lead their lives in accordance with the teachings of the Torah. So that's why the water is called holy and the earth is called holy because that water is not cursed and that or soil is not cursed. And its function, he even says, is to like um, bring about to be the instrument for the punishment of the woman who is returning to the transgression of her ancestress of Chava, that uh, like um, uh, defilement of which she is suspected. If indeed she is guilty, then it's like a return to the to the um, uh, original. Uh, transgression, the, the chet eitz hadas, and therefore the water and the the soil, who so to speak, suffered because of that, because they were cursed as a result of the chet. So they are the means by which the sentence and the punishment is meted out uh, to to this woman. So rather than see the uh, sota experience just as an example of an instance of marital suspicion and infidelity, which it may be that as well, but he casts it for us in the context of the, the human drama itself. And with this, he explains uh, why it's called Mascara Savon, etc. It doesn't recall only what she did with that uh, um, 
her paramour, but rather it recalls the chet eitz hadas at the very dawn of human history. I'd just like to, in the few minutes we have left, because we did start a few minutes late, um, so I want to just share with you a further thought, which he said, and I alluded to it earlier. We said at the beginning that he says, ish ish kitisteishto, and he says, daber va'amarta. So the double expression, we said, refers to the two possible scenarios which the Torah itself mentions. Either she's guilty, but she may be innocent. And if she's innocent, then rather than bringing about a curse, it actually brings about a blessing. Says Or HaChaim, towards the end of this chapter, if you look at Pasuk Chaf Ches 28, ha'isha But there's good news as well. If she, is, if she did not defile herself, if she's not guilty of this uh, uh, transgression, and she is pure, she's not tmea, but she's tahora, and she is cleansed, and she actually will conceive. And Rashi explains it means that uh, if uh, we were talking here about a marriage, a marriage which is in crisis, a marriage which is under the shadow of suspic- suspicion of, of infidelity, um, there personal life is probably not that uh, fulfilling. I'm talking about their their marital intimacy. So therefore, the consequence of her acquittal is that she will conceive. She will be able to to, uh, conceive a child. And Rashi says, if she was childless before, now she'll have children. If she had children that were maybe of uh, um, defective in some way, they'll be very fine, excellent, uh, you know, quality children. That's Vinik Savin Zara. Says the Arachayim that the Torah here says two things if you look closely. If she's not defiled, but she's pure. So why does it have to have to say Utahore? It could just say Litma if she's until now we've been discussing what happens if she is guilty, she will pay the price for it. But now the Torah is saying, Vim and if she's not uh, defiled, fine. So then uh, we know she's Tahora. Says Or Chaim, and not so quick. There are actually three possibilities. There's the woman who is guilty of, of infidelity, of adultery, and she pays the price. There's the scenario of the woman who is completely innocent. It was all a case of mistaken identity or something like that. And that is the woman who is cleansed and who is rewarded and blessed. But there's another possibility. Uh, and he's realistic here. And I think uh, it's something we can, uh, any, any person with a moment's thought can uh, certainly relate to. Uh, there's a certain stage of um, uh, romantic attraction and romantic interaction, which may uh, fall short of uh, sexual intercourse, but certainly is a form of betrayal in its own right. There can be uh, heavy petting and other terms, which I don't need to elaborate upon, but he refers to that. And he says that such a woman is not guilty of adultery, but she's not going to get the Mrs. Mattersdorf Award of the Year. She's not going to be regarded as the, you know, the Beis Yaakov uh, uh, mother honoree at the banquet, this woman, uh, if indeed she has uh, been in seclusion with another man and they've gotten up to a lot of mischief together, even if she has or they have stopped short of actual uh, adultery together. So that's what he says. If she is... Uh, if she is innocent of adultery, but she's gotten up to plenty of mischief, nevertheless, she's not going to get the blessing that will come. She'll be acquitted, and the marriage hopefully will be restored to a measure of of harmony. I hope so, and and you know, good luck to them. They deserve it. But if she's completely innocent, so that's utahora. That's the woman who is who is. Uh, uh, Tahora entirely, it was just mistaken identity or whatever it might be, then Vinizra Zara, etc., then she will be rewarded. 
I just would like to end on a more positive note. So very briefly, after the uh, Sota, we have immediately, uh, I say immediately because it follows sequentially in the Torah and the Mepharshim discuss what the connection may be, the Parsha of the Nazir. The Nazir is the Nazarite who takes the vow to abstain from wine, the vow to abstain from cutting his hair, grooming, and he also is bound by a prohibition of any contact with the dead. Those are the three uh, components of the Nazir. So the Parsha begins, if you look at uh, chapter six, the, I'm saying the Parsha of Nazir begins with chapter six. Daber b'nei seva marta alehem ish ish, I'm sorry, ish isha isha, so he makes a similar kind of observation that we spoke about a few minutes ago. There is a double expression here as well. It doesn't have to say Dibur and Amira. Moreover, the end of that verse, it says, Nazir lahazir lashem. We don't need the double expression. It would have been enough to say when he takes the vow of the Nazarite. That's all it has to say. But it adds on to become a Nazarite to God. Says the Or HaChaim, the Torah here is hinting to a very important distinction. This Nazir is discussed in the Talmud in a very fundamental way. Is he a sinner or is he a saint? Is he praiseworthy or is he blameworthy? The vow of the Nazir, is that something to be encouraged or something to be execrated? Is that to be admired or to be condemned? And interestingly, the Talmud, I've elaborated with a few synonyms, but the Talmud says, uh, records opinions on both sides. One who says he's a great guy and it's to be admired, and the other one says, no, he's called a sinner. Why? What's the basis of it? So the basis of it is very simple. The Torah does not forbid drinking wine. The Torah does not forbid getting a haircut, although it's a bit difficult with coronavirus now to find a barber. Fortunately, I've got Ruthie, or may you may say not so fortunate uh, because you can see my picture there. But anyway, it's a lot better than it was. Thank you, Ruthie. And the Torah certainly does not forbid contact with the dead. It can be a great mitzvah to accompany the, 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 the dead to his final resting place or to even be personally involved in it. Hever Kadisha is a great mitzvah. So if the Torah allows these things and this person forbids them to himself, so that's not to be encouraged. Or maybe he wants to reach a higher madrigan. So in brief, the Talmud records a saying, a teaching of one of the early sages of the Talmud, one of the first of the sages of the Talmud, uh, Shimon Hatzadik, Simon the Just. Shimon Hatzadik is recorded as saying, he was a uh, Kohen, Kohen Gadol, and he said, in all my days, I never ate from the korban of a Nazir. In other words, I didn't want to get involved with the offering brought by a Nazir. Probably, and this is the, the, the implication, because most Nazirim were either... Um, excuse me, trying to rehabilitate themselves from alcohol addiction, or they were trying to um, uh, sort of uh, like demonstrate haughtiness because of a person who allows his hair to grow, then he is visibly a Nazir and he's sort of like saying, look at me, how holy I am, how pious I am. This affectation of religiosity, so pompous. Uh, Shimon HaTzadik said, I didn't want to get involved with that. Uh, the Kohani would process said, I didn't feel right eating from such a Korban, except one case. One time a young man came to me and he was very good looking. And uh, he seemed to have like a, an aura of greatness about him. And I said to him, uh, you, you are a Nazir because he came to, was cutting his hair at the end of his uh, um, interval as a Nazir. He said, why, uh, why did you take the vow of the Nazarite? So he said as follows. He said, I uh, am a shepherd for my father's flock in the South. And on one occasion, I was grazing the flock and we went to a wellspring and the sheep were drinking and I looked into the water and I saw my visage, my reflection in the water. And I saw that I'm uh, very handsome, you know, George Clooney and um, uh, I'm sorry, I'm not that much up in, I'm not that much au fait with uh, um, 
celebrity uh, men or women. But in any case, I saw I was very good looking and my, my hair, which was so attractive and so, I guess, uh, alluring, my Yitzhahara was grabbing hold of me and saying, hey, you know, you're a good looking guy. You know, you shouldn't be a shepherd. You should uh, be on the stage or you should be in Hollywood. And I thought that Yitzhahara has ambushed me. And at that moment, I said, I'm going to take the vow of the Nazir so that my hair will grow and I won't look as um, uh, attractive uh, anymore. And that is going to be a way to counteract the enticements of my Yitzhahara. So Shimon HaTzadik says, when he told me that, I embraced him and I kissed him and I said, you're the kind of Nazir that, that we should have. You know, you are an admirable type of Nazir. Says the Orachayim, the Torah here is describing, referring to two types of, of Nazir. Mo, m, m, the, the Gemara seems to imply most of them are, are not that worthy. Meaning, as I say, they're either, either trying to compensate for a weakness that they have in terms of the bottle or whatever it might be, or they're just trying to show off. And therefore, that type of Nazir, it may be a decision that's right for him or maybe, may you know, responding to the demands of his uh, temptation uh, and maybe as I said before, if he's uh, too much prone to, to wine consumption, but it's not something to be encouraged or something to be aspired to. But there's another type of Nazir. There's a type of Nazir who is actually uh, taking the vow as a way of uh, engaging his Yitzhahara, of, of contending with his Yitzhahara, of overcoming his Yitzhahara. And by the way, the Nazir normally was not a lifetime endeavor. It was only 30 days. A person could take a vow for, for more than 30 days, but the, the default Nazir status was only 30 days. It was a temporary measure. It says Or HaChaim, that's what the Torah is referring to. It says, Dabir ben Ezra, Marta Lehem, Dabir, speak to them about the Nazir and the law of the Nazir if a person is, uh, has that weakness and he decides to become a Nazir. But Va'amarta Aleim refers to the higher type of Nazir, the Nazir who actually is, I can say in another passage, Lahazir Lashem. His vow of the Nazir is a way of getting close to Hashem. There may be other Nazirim who do it for other reasons. And this is the the sort of categorization. There's the, the praiseworthy Nazir, and there's the maybe run-of-the-mill Nazir as well. Says Or HaChaim, that's what the Torah is referring to. So I'm sorry we've gone over a bit, but we have explored, I think in some detail, uh, or at least we've looked at two of the fascinating mitzvahs of the Torah in this week's Parsha. Um, neither of them are very commonplace today. The Sota uh, I'm not saying the infidelity is unknown, but the phenomenon of the Sota, the way the Torah describes it, we no longer have. Nazir, in theory, we could have a Nazir. We don't have the chance to bring the carbon, but uh, there have been certain people, not many, who have been uh, uh, like... Um, associated with the vow of the Nazir. But in any case, for the most part, these are mitzvahs which are fascinating to study, although they may not be part of our uh, actual experience. And thank you for joining us for our time tonight. I wish everyone a wonderful Shabbos. Shkach.